Well, guys, I do not believe it. The moment of truth has come. The end is not near. The end is here. We are on our final reverse Peruvian plunge, heading back from Salvation to Cusco, wrapping up Chapter 28, Adonde Vas? Where are you going? Bringing us to the end of Peruvian Plunge, we find ourselves in Salvation, Peru on Friday, July 31st, 2009. I awoke on the morning of my very last day in the Peruvian Amazon, so far anyway, to a pounding headache due to the heady combination of the previous evening cerveza and the ceaseless crowing of the flock of brainless roosters. My first emergency order, order of the day was trotting downstairs to Hotel Mierda's seatless and, of course, paperless community bathroom, which had the ambience and charm of a pigsty. That irritating business out of the way, I returned to my cavernous little cubicle to organize and pack my various cannonballs into the two main big bags, my backpack and the rucksack, plus a day pack and my laptop case. The very thought of dragging this two tons of shit from this pit and salvation to my hotel in Cusco, a two bus, one taxi, two hike, descent into hell, that would take me 18 hours, just about brought me to my knees. I lay there on the sagging mattress, just staring up at the cobweb encrusted ceiling, wondering how in the hell I had come from my comfortable home in South Austin, Texas, to this fucking pit. What was the point exactly? <clears throat> The caffeine call finally got my ass in gear and I returned to the Shayla for a double dose of Nescafe. I told Moose I would meet him at noon for lunch at Tammy's restaurant. Then I whiled away my last morning in the Peruvian Amazon at the Internet Cafe, chatting away the day with folks from Cusco to South Austin. A little before noon, I headed back to Hotel Mierda made one last defensive stop in the community pigsty before embarking on my 18-hour odyssey and loaded myself down with every material possession I had to my name, staggering uphill the three blocks to Tammy's restaurant under the heavy load, I truly felt like the overloaded beast of burden that I was. I was greeted by hoots of laughter from Moose and the nice family that ran the restaurant. Unloading my burden and collapsing into a chair, I brayed like a burrow. Ruth, the matriarch of the family and Salvacion's best cook, whipped up a big plate of fried fish for lunch and Moose Mulligan and I shared our last meal together. He had to eat hurriedly as he had an important meeting with a team of surveyors to figure out the best place to begin the 300 miles of seismic testing lines, a job he hoped to start the following Monday morning. Samuel, it's always nice meeting fellow travelers, Moose said, shaking my hand and wishing me luck with my book. It's been real. And it's been fun, it just hasn't been real fun. With those final words, my favorite planet eater headed out the door and down the hill to meet his team of surveyors. I mentioned to the family that I had to get going to catch my bus. Pablo, the patriarch of the gang, told me absolutely not that he was just getting ready to take his daughter, son-in-law, and two grandkids to Pilcapatha to catch the afternoon bus to Cusco, and that I was coming with them in the family Toyota pickup. Minutes later, we all piled into the pickup. 
with about a dozen other folks clambering into the back for the bumpy ride, despite the fact that a comfortable bus with seats would be leaving in an hour. For the next two hours, I rolled along the highway that paralleled the south bank of the Mother of God, looking in vain for one tree from the original forest that had blanketed the countryside just a few years before. Though I never did see one old-growth jungle giant in two hours, I did see the brand new bridge going in over the Rio Carbone, where I had almost been buried under a pile of gravel in the back of a truck two months earlier. Pablo chauffeured me to the front door of Pilcapata's bus station, where I was overjoyed to see a brand new shiny green tour bus that looked like it had just rolled off the assembly line. If that gift from the universe wasn't enough, the bus was going to be pulling out in 45 minutes. Really? and was scheduled to arrive in Cusco just before midnight, as opposed to the other beat-up old bus car that was scheduled to arrive at 6 a.m. Total price for the 8-hour, 130-mile trip? Seven bucks. Waiting in the crowd of passengers was none other than my old buddy Ernesto, the wild man hotel proprietor from Atalaya, shirtless in the hot sun. He was admiring a brand new Caterpillar bulldozer on the back of a truck heading toward Hunt Oil's base camp in Salvacion. Ernesto, whose last sight of me was in the back of a dump truck headed in the general direction of my new wildlife center, seemed positively shocked that I was still alive. Right on schedule at 3 p.m., the packed tour bus pulled out of Pilcapata Station and we began the long, torturous climb out of the jungle towards Tres Cruces Pass. For the first 30 minutes, as the ravaged lowland rainforest slowly surrendered to the lush green cloud forest that miraculously still survives to this day, I busied myself giving English lessons to Pablo and Ruth's grandson. <clears throat> My air set's job as English professor came to a grinding halt, literally, when the fancy city bus we were riding in encountered its first bridgeless creek crossing on the narrow dirt highway leading to the summit. The front half of the bus rolled right on across the gully, but the back half didn't fare so well. There was the ugly sound of a muffler hitting rock, and two seconds later, the rear end of the bus was hopelessly grounded in the dirt, unable to move one inch forward. The basic flaw was not in the design of the bus itself. The 40-foot-long, low-slung cruiser was built just perfectly for the smooth, paved highways and city streets for which it was designed, but... The flaw was in the seriously flawed decision of the Peruvian bus company to run such a fine, expensive machine over such a rough road. This bus clearly had no business on this road, as any gringo over the age of three could have told you. Like everything else in Peru, this gringo disaster was turned into a perfect excuse for a party. To lighten the load pressing the muffler and the rear end of the bus into the roadbed, we all filed off the bus and crossed the gully on foot. Meanwhile, several of the men on the bus, led by Ernesto, now clothed in a pile-lined blue jeans jacket in the cool mist of the forest, piled rocks in front of the rear wheels to give the big bus that extra half-inch boost in altitude it needed to clear the hurdle. With great hoots of celebration from the friendly crowd of Peruvians, we all clambered back onto the bus and settled back into our seats. Five minutes later, and five minutes after that, and five minutes after that, and five minutes after that, the entire ritual was repeated over and over again. We filed off the bus, 
crossed whatever canyon was in our path on foot and filed back onto the bus. Never did I hear one word of complaint about this exercise in frustration, which could have been so easily avoided if the bus company had simply bought a fucking bus with better ground clearance. It was plainly obvious to me that this flashy, expensive, expensive piece of equipment was going to be battered into hamburger meat within three months, but nobody on the bus, least of all the driver employed by the company, seemed aware of this fact. Or, if they were aware of it, they could give a shit. Between the creek crossing adventures I entertained Pablo and Ruth's family and the surrounding passengers with spanglish tales of my adventures in Peru, I shared my opinions about Hunt Oil with the folks who were mostly unaware of Hunt Oil. From there, I got into the subject of the Handbook for the New Paradigm series of books I dug through my baby day pack and produced a copy of Becoming, which was passed around the seats for inspection. When it arrived in the hands of Alessandra, the four-year-old Jesus freak granddaughter of Ruth and Pablo, who was clutching a sheet of gum-backed Jesus stickers, she plastered a picture of the, her golden hair, haloed savior on the front of the book, just to the left of the sunrise. Somehow, the picture of Jesus got me onto the discussion of my first San Pedro trip, not the one in Peru, in which I had had a vision of Jesus and Quetzalcoatl and the Hopi Red Star Kachina. From there, the wide-ranging Spanglish conversation moved on to UFOs, 2012, and the coming apocalypse, the strongly Catholic family seemed to have no problem discussing these subjects, and San Pedro, Ayahuasca, and Magic Mushrooms with their four-year-old daughter and nine-year-old son. It was quite an amazing journey up the hill in the gathering darkness. Just before night fell and covered the bus in darkness for good, we entered the tunnel through the mountainside, the rough rock walls illuminated in the ghostly light of the headlights passed by inches in front of my face on the other side of the window. It was like we were descending into some other world on a bus journey into some parallel universe that held who know what adventures. We inched along carefully. If the bus had hung up inside the tunnel, the bus door would not have been able to open, and we would literally have been trapped inside the oversized tin can. But we emerged unscathed from the other side of the tunnel into total darkness, and the conversation wound down into more mundane subjects as folks settled down to sleep. The thick, the thick cloud forest was lost to me in the darkness and the clouds. It would be the last time I would see the Peruvian Amazon for six weeks. I was glassy-eyed with exhaustion when we pulled into Puerto Combo sometime around 8 p.m. We stretched our legs while the driver and his assistant changed a tire that had been damaged in one of the creek crossings. The Milky Way stretched out from horizon to horizon over the Andes. We all bundled up against the cold. Somewhere beyond Puerto Combo, I succumbed to exhaustion. I have no memory of even passing through PSAC. When the captain turned on the radio and tuned it to the single most awful radio station, this side of the U.S., we were already pulling into Cusco, hurtling down a smooth, divided highway lined with gas stations and all-night diners, it was like awakening from a month-long dream. Our interplanetary bus ride from Pilcapatha to Cusco cruised to a halt right about midnight. I climbed out of the bus and waited for the captain to unload my bag of cannonballs. I was telling the family goodbye and looking for a taxi 
when they insisted that I come home with them. That was the best idea I had heard all day. We all loaded into a cab together and headed out into the cold night. I had no idea where I was or where I was going. All I knew was that I was headed to a warm bed. Well, make that couch. There I was, almost 50 years old, crashing on some stranger's couch. When was this craziness ever going to end? When I was 90? And this brings us to the last day in Peruvian plunge back in Cusco, Peru on Saturday morning, August 1st, 2009. I was routed from my fitful night's sleep on the couch by the kabooms of fireworks, which in turn set off the barking of dogs, a couple of car alarms, and the enraged howling of some unseen infant in another room. I know exactly how you feel, kid, I grumbled as I fumbled for my little alarm clock. 6.42 on a Saturday morning in Cusco, and already the explosions and the partying and the parades were beginning. Christ, does anyone in this city ever sleep? Wiping the cobwebs from my brain, I surveyed my two back-breaking bags of cannonballs and the other attendant flotsam and jetsam from the spiritual path scattered about me. Here I was, six weeks shy of my 50th birthday, crashing on some couch in a stranger's living room in Peru. Guys my age just were not supposed to be doing this kind of shit with their lives. I negotiated my way through the strange house to the kitchen where the happy family was already gathered around the breakfast table. Angela, the daughter of Ruth and Pablo, the restaurant owners from Salvacion, poured me a piping hot cup of Nescafe and I was reborn. Perhaps sensing my rebirth from my comatose state, Alessandra, the four-year-old Jesus freak in the high chair beside me, who unbelievably was still clutching the sheet of Jesus stickers from the bus ride the day before, selected a small round sticker of her Savior hanging from the cross and slapped it on my forehead in the middle of my third eye. To open it or close it, I wasn't sure. The whole family agreed it was the perfect touch. As much as the family begged me to stay with them, I politely declined as I needed to get back to my typing in my office at the South American Explorers Club across town. Amid much muchas gracias farewell, I loaded myself down with every material possession I owned outside of Texas and set off into the blinding sun of a chilly Saturday morning. As I walked the four blocks to the nearest busy street in the unfamiliar neighborhood, I noticed that many, if not most, of the homes along my route had piles of yellow confetti spread around their doorstops. I stopped to ask a fellow out walking his dog what that was all about. Don't you know, he asked me, genuinely surprised. Today is the 1st of August, the Inca New Year. The little yellow pieces of paper, which I think were the modern-day urban stand-in for sacred kernels of corn, maybe, are offerings to the gods asking for good luck and prosperity in the coming new year. Well, of course, another excuse for a party in Cusco, I thought, as another fusillade of explosions ripped the early morning quiet. I staggered like an overloaded llama to the wide boulevard ahead of me, trying to get my bearings. Arriving at the thoroughfare, already filling with cars and pedestrians, I surveyed the endless string of gas stations, fast food chicken joints, and tacky billboards stretching off into the sunrise. Avenida de la Cultura, Avenue of Culture, 
the street sign told me. I flagged down a tiny Chinese-made cab and filled it to overflowing with my bags of cannonballs. The cabbie stared at me like I had horns growing from my head, and I remembered Jesus in the middle of my forehead. What the hell? I left him there. Adonde vas? Where are you going? The cabbie asked me. San Blas, I said, referring to the pleasant hillside gringo refuge I could just make out in the distance. The cabbie gave me one of those weird gringo shrugs they are so famous for and pulled the tiny car into the swelling river of traffic, narrowly averting a collision with an oncoming bus. The bus driver blasted his horn and flipped the cabbie off. Ah, it was great to be back in the real world. With Jesus in his skivvies and a crown of thorns opening my third eye, surrounded by my meager but still too many worldly possessions overflowing the back seat of a Chinese cab on the avenue of culture in Cusco, Peru, on a Saturday morning with fireworks booming, I glanced to my left shoulder. Spirit was lounging there in her new bikini, soaking up the sun on a warm Chilean beach and sipping a slushy Pisco Sour. She winked at me and said, You work too damn hard, dude. It's the Inca New Year, for Christ's sake. Don't you think it's time to call this book a wrap and give it a rest for a while? There will be plenty of time for more adventures down the road. That totally unexpected announcement out of the blue knocked me for a loop, and I hardly noticed when we arrived in the gringo-infested safe zone of trendy San Blas. Adonde vas? the cabbie asked me again. It's hard to explain exactly where I'm going, I told him. Just take me as far as you can drive up the seven little angels to the top of the hill and drop me off there where I am heading. It's impossible to drive a car. And there we go. The end of Peruvian Plunge. What do you think, little dog? And I really, really appreciate you guys hanging with me. And one more time, you can go on lulu.com and buy this book for $5 and read it yourself or send it to your friends. Anyway, what an adventure that was. Bye, guys.